Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon on our fourth session in a series of weekly webinars that will happen on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. through mid-June. Today, we are thrilled to have NAEA Supervision and Administration leaders, Lorinda Rice and Lisa Stewart-Whitehead with us. They will be facilitating a conversation surrounding current issues supervisors are facing during this pandemic. A few quick housekeeping things before we get started. We would love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can during our time together. In the last portion of the session, we'll have some time for you to raise your hand and verbally contribute to the conversation. Also, just a reminder that we are recording this session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who might like to watch. Can you move to the next slide? We would also really love to hear your feedback on many of the topics we're going to cover this afternoon. If you could visit tinyurl.com slash artsupers2020 and tell us what you're struggling with, what your concerns are, what you need for the future, that would be super helpful. We'll also enter you to win it to a drawing to win a copy of Differentiated Instruction in Art. Uh, next slide. It's my pleasure to introduce these two lovely women this afternoon. Um, we have with us Lorinda Rice and Lisa Stewart Whitehead. Uh, Lorinda Rice is the Curriculum Specialist for Visual Art at Lincoln Public Schools in Lincoln, Nebraska and serves a serves 95 K-12 art educators. She has earned a BFA and an MS in, in education from Northwest Missouri State University and a master's in education administration from Concordia, Concordia University in Nebraska. Her career has included graphic design work for Bailey Lowerman and Associates, high school art educator in Columbus Public Schools and elementary art specialist with Lincoln Public Schools. In her 22 years in art education, Lorinda serves as National Art Education Association Supervision and Administration Division Director and has also served as Western Region Representative for the NAEA Elementary Division, NAEA Professional Learning Through Research and Learning Supervisor and Administration Representative, NAEA Delegates Assembly, Nebraska Art Teacher Association Co-President, Youth Art Month Chairperson. Lorinda served on the Nebraska Fine Arts Standards Team and was the recipient of the NADA Elementary Art Educator of the Year and Supervisor of the Year Awards. She has presented at museums, state and national conferences on various topics, including the importance of art education for creative, pro creative problem solvers of the future and arts integration. She is a practicing artist with studio space at the Burke Holder. She lives in Lincoln, Nebraska with her husband and son. Lisa Stewart Whitehead taught elementary art for nine years and was the content specialist for art, theater, and dance for Montgomery County Public Schools in Rockville, Maryland for seven years. Currently, she is the visual arts supervisor for Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland, where she supervises over 276 pre-K to 12 art teachers. Prince George's County is a pioneer in arts integration with 90 schools and growing. Lisa received a Bachelor's of Science in Art Education from the University of Maryland in College Park, a Master of Arts in Education from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, and her Certificate in Supervision and Administration from the University of Maryland in College Park. Lisa has co-authored two books, Using Art to Teach Reading Comprehension Strategies and Using Art to Teach Writing Traits, along with other articles in School Arts Magazine. Lisa has traveled extensively throughout the world and in 2006 was awarded a, Jap a Japan Fulbright Scholarship. In 2020, Lisa received the National Superv Supervision and Administration Award and the Marion Quinn Dix Leadership Award from the National Art Education Association. She has presented at museums as well as numerous state and national conferences on various topics concerning literacy, curriculum, assessment, and instruction. 
She is a past NAEA board member and is currently the Supervision and Administration Division Representative on the NAEA Research Commission. She loves to find ways for children to use, to use art to deepen their understanding of other subjects and believes that all children can access the same level of understanding in different ways. Using art is one such way. Lisa lives in Maryland with her husband, Christopher, and her two children. In this session, if you can move to the next slide, the presenters will discuss the results of a survey conducted to gauge the current needs, concerns, and support facing art supervisors through this difficult time. This session is intended to provide a forum for all of your th thoughts to be heard. We ask that you use the chat box and Q&A buttons for the first part of the session, and then we'll open the session up for a verbal discussion via the raised hand function. And so I will cue you when the raise hand function will be used, but otherwise, please, please use the chat and the Q&A. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Lisa and Lorinda. Thank you, Christy. It's so good to be here with everyone and um, good to see faces, familiar faces that we would have seen in Minneapolis just a month ago. So um, it, we're excited to see um, everyone join us today. Um, Lisa and I thought we'd start out with an overview of what we've been experiencing as supervisors in our work. And I also need to apologize about the um, survey. Unfortunately, in my district, they um, created a block on the Google. So many of you may have tried to do the Google form and it did not work. But Christy has created a new link to that. So if you have and want to go in and give us your responses, we will look at that. And um, we're excited to see what you have to offer us. So I'm in week seven of this online learning, remote learning um, piece with my teachers, and it has been an interesting um, ride so far. Um, as art educators, we are so used to being in the classroom with that hands-on learning that it took us a little while to figure out what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. Um, we started with spring break on March 9th and then the students just didn't come back. And uh, we did have teachers come back into the buildings for three days just to close up shop and kind of grab the things that they needed, but we were unable to hand out supplies to students or to really um, give them an opportunity to come in and get anything. They each had a Chromebook and they do have those at home with them. So um, we went to some different ways of thinking and we used two weeks of review time for students just to get um, online to see what it was like learning from home. And we gave them a lot of different um, small activities. After that two weeks, our teachers started to teach new content. Um, I do have uh, weekly meetings with my teachers, which has been a good thing f as a support piece, really, so that they could um, have a time to connect with each other, to share their strengths and the things that are going well, and then an opportunity to also um, share their struggles so that we could work through those different ideas. Uh, we are not grading. Um, we don't believe that we can really, without materials, um, do the things that we would need to do for grading and assessment. So we are looking at um, giving students um, information and feedback through um, Zoom meetings or um, feedback on our Google Classroom, but we are not going to give a grade for this quarter. Lisa, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, some similar things and some not similar things. Uh, also, our students don't have access to supplies right now. Um, our teachers, uh, we, we um, stopped learning or stopped physical learning in the classroom and then our students went on a two week break while we figured out what we were gonna do. So they were home uh, with packets that were handed out on a Friday um, and then uh, they had two weeks to work on those packets as we then switched over to distance learning. Um, in those packets were no art uh, lessons whatsoever. And so um, they did not have any art instruction for those two weeks. Um, then we came up with a distance learning plan uh, and handed out one Chromebook Per family. So if uh, a family has three or more kids, they are all sharing one Chromebook, which makes it really challenging. 
Um, the teachers left all their items in their schools, so they, uh, they're still there, they're still trapped in their schools, and so they don't have access to any of those items. Um, our, our teachers are now using Google Classroom. They're pre-recording their lessons. They're teaching in high school uh, on Fridays is their elective day to receive their elective instruction. And then for elementary and middle school, they're receiving one art lesson every four weeks. And so those teachers are only teaching every four weeks. And then grading, we are grading. We are doing um, a pass or an incomplete for uh, quarter four. So um, yeah, so that's, that's what's happening in my school system. So I think some of the immediate needs that we had started listing here, some ideas that we had, um, because I'm meeting with my teachers also on a weekly basis, uh, like Lorinda, um, is teaching teachers how to teach online. And um, you know, that's, that's, that's been a lot. I have explained it like all my teachers are back in their first year of teaching. Um, so you read in my bio that I have, 276 teachers and um, they all have varying degrees of needs but pretty much we're all trying to figure out how to do distance learning at the same time so I feel like I've got 276 brand new teachers <laughs> I don't know if you feel the same way Lorinda um, and then Lorinda, you said you're not you're doing any you're not doing any grading. Uh oh, Lorinda lost her audio. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. We're some some districts in my area are trying to figure out how to get um, art supplies out to students. Um, we've been told that whatever we provide to a student right now, uh, we can't get back to them in any way um, because of the virus. So some um, districts in my area are trying to figure out how to get um, art supplies out to their students. Some have uh, art centers, local art centers that are putting together art supplies um, to hand out to students. Um, and I think an, another thing that we're looking at is how to get our teachers that uh, quick real time support, whereas before we would have to make an appointment with um, A teacher, we might have to then go drive out to their school. Well, now I can just say, Oh, you have a question. Let's just jump quickly on a Google Hangout and uh, you know, I can give them kind of real time support that's live within minutes. Um, I just had a teacher today um, send me a message and saying, well, how often am I supposed to grade and how can I bring this conversation up with my principal? So I kind of troubleshoot on a case by case basis um, with my teachers. Lorinda, are you back? I'm back. Yay. This, this is the Good. beauty of technology. Yay. Stuff that our teachers are running into, right? That's right. exactly right. We do have a question for you, Lisa, while um, Lorinda catches up here. Um, what happens if a student receives an incomplete, if you're doing pass or incomplete, what, what is the plan for that? Yeah, we're at a no fault, uh, I, th I think that's what they're calling it. Do no harm, I think is the um, quotes that they actually put in our um, in our, our distance learning plan. So if they receive an incomplete, it it really um, doesn't hurt them at all. It really is, they're, they're going off their grades from the first three quarters. And then it will actually say on their report card that the incomplete was during, I, I don't know if it'll actually say like COVID-19 or the pandemic or something, but it will be identified on their report card as why they received that incomplete during this time. We have a similar thing with, that we're doing um, here with um, asking teachers to do an unsatisfactory or satisfactory. And we just did a mid-quarter um, connection with families and let them know that there may be some unsatisfactory where students weren't participating. And that allowed um, parents to then encourage their students, but it doesn't um, do any harm to their grade. And 
all of our unsatisfactories and satisfactories are from the um, third quarter. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've also told our students that in the fall, they can make up anything and have their um, grade readjusted from this quarter four. So if they come back in the fall and they got an incomplete, the most they can get is a pass. So they would just have to complete the work, turn that in, and then they would be able to be eligible for the, for the pass to be changed back in their report card. But that's a really good question because I know um, grading, I think grading right now is the thing I talk about the most with my teachers at the moment. <laughs> it's the thing they have the most questions about. Yeah. Um, because we moved to a non-grading policy, I think that was the hardest thing for my teachers to wrap their heads around because they felt like um, the grade was something that our students would want and we could use. different levels and, um, and new ways to think about the social and emotional needs. Great. Um, should we go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So a few weeks ago, um, I sent out a quick email to a group of supervisors just asking them what the biggest surprises were during the remote learning. And um, one of the biggest things that people um, brought up was the inequities that we're actually um, really aware of now and how people don't have either access to technology or even access to materials. And um, then there was also the huge gap of technology and the abilities of our teachers. And I think those are um, three things that we are thinking about as supervisors as we move through the next few weeks to support each other through this school year. In our district for technology needs, we are doing um, hotspots for families who may need um, access to internet, but I don't know if it's for like this for you, Lisa, but I even had teachers who didn't have access to um, technology or internet at home. They just used their phone and their unlimited data. So we were trying to support them in getting access to um, Wi-Fi in their homes. Yeah, I, I do have a few that's, that um, came to me with the same or similar issue about getting Wi-Fi or stable Wi-Fi um, with enough data um, at home to be able to do the work. We um, al are allowing students and teachers to go use the school parking lot as a hub, um, but you know that that has its own challenges as well. I I actually don't know how many students and teachers have have utilized that, so that would be interesting to to see that information on whether anyone has has gone to the school to use those uh, to use the Wi-Fi within the school. Um, the technology um, gap has been really wide amongst my teachers, I would say. Um, I have some teachers who have never been on a single Zoom, Google Hangout call in their entire life, didn't, didn't even know how to press the uh, uh, hang up or the answer buttons. And so I would get on the phone, I'd be like, okay, see the green? Okay, yeah, that, push that one. And, um, you know, so that was challenging. And then I've got teachers who are um, way, way, way advanced in all of that. So um, it's been really interesting trying to help all of my teachers le learn this new way of talking and communicating. Yeah, it really was um, interesting, wasn't it? I think another thing for our teachers was the idea of Zooming with students. Um, mm. And I've read this online also, teachers having students come to a quote unquote classroom and they may still be laying in bed or they're eating cereal as they're being a part, part of online remote learning. And um, so we've had to create some norms around that and ask mm -hmm. students to um, 
be prepared. Another thing that we started to do just in the last two weeks was to um, set out an agenda for our students for the Zoom meetings so that they can know what we're going to be talking about and um, it can give them some ideas of what they can bring to that Zoom meeting with their teacher. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Okay, um, so I guess in the last bullet about resources, uh, it was really interesting. I think in the very beginning, um, we just got, I don't know about any of the other supervisors on this call, but I got inundated with the amount of resources that was like being flying at me, you know, like all, every company that I've ever followed for any reason at all was like, I'll, I'm going to send you this and I'm going to send you that. And here's this, and here's this resource. And we're making this free. And some of that, it was great. Like I was so excited to see how many different companies were offering, um, you know, free or complimentary things between now and the end of the school year. But to me, it was really overwhelming. I had a hard time kind of deciding like what to send to my teachers, what not. I didn't want to send them everything because they were all overwhelmed as well. Um, and so, you know, I look to see, well, what do we already have and how can we better utilize it? Um, and so I'll, I'll just, you know, say real quick, like Davis, we have the Davis e-textbooks and that was just an easy um, way to like insist my teachers like, all right, look, we've already paid for these. It's time to really start like, let's step it up. You know, how can we make sure that this is part of your instruction more than it was before? Right. So that was really nice. Um, all of the different vendors and um, companies that have come out to say here, use our resources during this time. And um, Davis has been very generous in, in allowing us all of these resources for free. And that has really helped. But like you said, helping our um, teachers curate that information mm -hmm. and make it something that um, would be manageable during this time has been kind of a surprise. And we do want to reach out and say thank you to all of the different museums um, mm -hmm. and the different resources that allowed us to use images um, for this, this remote learning time. Yeah. Shall yeah, we move nice to the slide. next slide? And then also um, another topic that we thought of is what we became more aware of whenever we started this. And that again includes those inequities of supplies, internet and technology. Um, but for some of us, uh, it also brought out um, our age and how we remember those times of um, salt dough and um, I made salt dough as a kid, right? <laughs> right? I colored it. <laughs> right, exactly. Or even um, creating paste from flour and water to be able to do some paper mache types of things or to create a glue for different things that they're making. So um, it was fun to um, share those with our younger teachers and make them available to them and see their faces go from, oh, you don't have to go to the store to buy it, but you can actually find some of those things in your home. Mm -hmm. Another thing that came um, apparent was communication and how um, we need to make make sure that it was clear that we were doing it often and it was repeated. And in my case, what I would do is I would also record all of our meetings so that if a teacher wanted to go back to it later, they could go back and listen and find the information again. Um, we also had someone who was the note taker and those notes are available to everyone. So those really helped um, teachers with those frequently asked questions and um, about grading or, you know, as we moved through the system and figured out our IB courses and our AP courses, we had to create different links and connections for those teachers. And this last bullet was really, um, you know, something that I brought up was that I've really been thinking a lot about what is essential in our curriculum. Like what are those skills and problems um, if as we deliver online instruction and, and figuring out what the student has or doesn't have at home, we really can't say that they're all going to have access to paint. So is um, painting skills really what we need to be giving them right now? And so 
what if that's not what we can give them, what can we give them? What do we need to give them during this time? Um, and it even has me thinking about the fall and if, you know, if, if this is going to continue into the fall or just in curriculum in general from now on, you know, so what are those skills are open ended problem solving and how can I um, engage them with um, critical problems and, and challenging uh, issues for them to solve using whatever they have at home. Right. And so it's exciting because all those cookie cutter lessons are now gone. My teachers who have been holding on to them so tight, like I am not going to stop teaching this lesson that I've been teaching for the last 30 years of my career. Well, now they can't teach it anymore. And so or they've um, adapted it. Yeah. Or they've figured out a way to boil it down to, well, what was really important about that lesson and how can um, I still teach those skills in this new way. Yes. Um, so that's been kind of exciting, I think. I love the um, fact that my teachers are um, noticing that what they worried about most were those materials and the end product that um, my students were going to um, have at the um, final piece. But now they're really enjoying the process and kids are sharing the process um, in photographs from their Chromebook or their phone and then showing their thinking about what it is that they're creating and using whatever materials they have, which allowed my teachers to have an aha moment of, I don't have to worry so much about um, those supplies as here are some possible solutions through this theme or big idea and these essential questions. Now go and tell me how you're going to um, create and solve this in a unique way. And um, our middle level schools are really seeing students um, engage in this and really love what they're coming up with. Uh, Nancy Walkup has just um, shared with us the um, online art teachers K through 12 group on Facebook and they do have a lot of really great things um, going on in that and that is a wonderful um, space to go to. And we are seeing a lot of teachers um, trying out this new idea of what is a theme, a theme of um, hope or place in space mm -hmm. or connections or care and then how do we ask um, some really good essential questions and guiding questions to help our students um, start to think through that and then solve that problem mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's really great it's very exciting right now to see this shift I think so all right let's go to the next slide um, we have a question really quick I'm sorry I'm just gonna uh -huh. Yep. In really fast. Um, one of the um, supervisors online has asked, were they, were you able to send out the Davis eBooks to each student? And if so, or if not, how were you um, able to use it? And I'll just answer that question because yeah. I know how. Um, <laughs> if you are currently a, um, a customer of Davis Digital, then you just simply have to reach out to the Davis Digital team and they will set up your student accounts. If you are not currently a Davis Digital customer, um, but you would like to use the resource, there is an option to choose student ebook access in the form that you fill out for access to Davis Digital. So either way, there are many materials for the students to use. Yeah. And um, we have been using, I think uh, we're on maybe our fourth year of Davis Digital and our students log in through their online portal and that's where they get access to all their textbooks. So it's been really great because a teacher can assign, um, you know, within that student, it's all based on what classes they're enrolled in. And so if they're enrolled in a first grade class, they get the first grade book and then the teacher can say, okay, we're going to read this page and do this project and um, can kind of follow along and the students can log in and have access to that. We've also been using um, the uh, cards of the contemporary STEAM artists um, with um, Marilyn Stewart and those have come in really handy um, for teachers to rethink about um, their units and their lessons. So the next slide is all about um, adaptations for the new school year. And um, what are we thinking about as we move into that? I saw that someone wrote in the chat that um, some schools are thinking about going back to school starting June 1st. 
here in the Midwest. Um, we are not going to go back to school, but we are talking about um, if we start this new school year as a remote learning and then eventually come back. And um, so our summer is going to be spent in um, recreating and thinking about those first possibly nine weeks, that first um, quarter of the school year, and how we might be able to um, upgrade and get teachers in, um, in line for that online learning piece for any deficiencies or um, new learning that they may need, and then um, where we need to go with our students and their technologies. What about you, Lisa? Yeah, so um, we actually have not closed. We are one of the nine, I guess, states that have not officially closed for the rest of the school year. Um, so we are now set to come back on May 14th. Ha ha ha, yeah, right. Um, but so I, we've been going like a month at a time. They close a month at a time. And so right now on May 14th is our next uh deadline. And so about a week prior to that, our um, head of uh, our State Department of Education will come on and then probably tell us that, you know, another month or to the end of the school year. Um, so uh, what that has caused is that we haven't, we're starting to think about the fall. We are definitely um, have been thinking about summer. Um, and so we're not exactly sure it's all kind of up in the air at the moment. Um, but one thing and why I wrote these two pieces is that can we or how would we, I think this is something that we need to be thinking about, close this technology gap by August. So for example, I, I stated earlier that um, we only handed out one Chromebook per family. And so for students who, uh, or for families that have these three students at home and they're all sharing one device, and they're trying to do Zoom calls or they're trying to do Google Hangouts with their teachers, like that, that can't stay that way. And so how can we make sure that every student has their own device and a stable internet access? And so I know that um, that is something that our superintendent is working on and trying to figure out. And then another thing that I've been thinking about and um, because we have a summer school program and we're actually for that program uh, it's a summer school program for uh, kindergarten and first grade students, um, incoming kindergarten and incoming first grade students at several of our schools to kind of, uh, it's like a bridge program where they get extra support for a month. Um, and that happened last year on site. And so we're now going to do that um, digitally. And so we're creating supply kits. And then we're trying to figure out, do we drop ship those supply kits directly to the students? Um, I've created what goes in them for those, for those um, four weeks. And then the art teachers that we've hired to teach at those summer programs will utilize what's in those kits um, to create their lessons that we can now guarantee that uh, each of those students will have in their homes. Um, so how do we then scale that up? if at all possible to an entire school system. Is that possible? Um, and, uh, you know, how, how would we do something like that? Um, we've been told that what gets delivered at the meal sites uh, that we have can only be, be food and essential items. And so um, will that cover school supplies for next year? I have no idea. Will we have to redo our entire school system budget to be able to do something like that? Possibly. Um, so it's just some questions that we're currently facing and I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what other supervisors are dealing with it as well in terms of next year and how we would make something like that happen. Yeah, that's a, a really good question, especially for larger districts. Um, because uh, how would you scale it to, in my district, right. 43,000 students so that they'd have access to materials? Um, and the other thing that we're thinking about too is if we come back in the fall and we do um, a model where um, students with a last name 
A to M come on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then students with the last name N to Z come on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. How do you make sure all of the supplies or tools are wiped down and ready for those students the next day and um, continue to support them? We're also talking about flipped classrooms. What would it look like if we gave assignments online to help students start thinking about the work and then once they came to the school they could jump in and really start making um, those are other options that we're thinking through let's mm -hmm. check the chat and see what's yeah we have a couple of questions about supplies here i think people are concerned with um when you go back what kind of supply maintenance is going to be required or are you thinking about waiting you know 72 hours in between using scissors with one group and the next group are you going to wipe down what if there's droplets in the air for all these 26 kids in a small amount of space and then we have another question here about what actually goes in the supply kits mm -hmm. so i'll i'll explain what i put in the supply kit for um my um uh, kindergarten and first grade and so they're each getting the basic drawing supplies um, a, a pack of colored pencils oil pastels markers um, a pack of pencils um, they're getting uh, a pair of scissors they're getting a glue bottle they're getting um, because they're um, younger they're getting a pack of uh, Chanel uh, sticks they're getting um, a pack of um, popsicle sticks. Um, I try to get them all wiggly eyes, but that was not cost effective. Um, so I, tr I just tried to like look to see what could I, I boil down these. Oh, they're getting paper, a sketchbook. Um, and I, I actually was able to create that entire kit for, uh, I think it was $27. And then um, the company that we went with wanted a kitting fee, which is like to kit the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, into one package and then drop ship that to the to the uh, child's house. So um, yeah, it's not cheap. It mm -hmm. certainly is uh, much more cost effective to send it all to the warehouse and then for us uh, as a school system to put it all together. But then, you know, with that was that causes its own issues. And so um, that's just what we ended up doing just for this small pro. There's only 500 kids in this program. So it was much more manageable. I have 130,000 students. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that those are all things that we'll um, be watching um, some of our European counterparts to see what they're doing as um, yeah. they get ready. Um, they're a little bit ahead of us. And even like you, Lisa, are ahead of us. Um, here in the Midwest, being on the East Coast, um, to see and hear from you gives me something to think about as I get ready to prepare for that. But I think everyone has their fingers crossed in their hopes that there will be some sort of um, way to bring students back. But if you think about social distancing in a classroom where we on average have about 30 to 33 students per um, classroom, there, there's no way to social distance that. So we're really trying to think through, and I know some of um, teachers on the West Coast have about 50 um, students in a classroom. So there's really no way to make that happen safely. And so we're gonna have to really be creative in this piece as we think about adaptations for the new school year. Are there any other questions out there from anyone that's listening about um, or ideas of what your district is talking about for adaptations? Please share those with us. How are teachers feeling? Overwhelmed would be yeah. one of the top words that I would use right now. Um, yeah. I think though that I'm also um, encouraged by teachers and their um, ability to Per persevere and really go through all of these changes and use each other as supports. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, we are as a group wanting to um, plan out already for next year. And so um, just yesterday, as we met as high school teachers, we were talking about getting um, our classes into instead of um, having pottery classes and sculpture classes and painting classes. What if we just created art level one, art level two, and art level three classes to start out next year and go through that first semester? And what would that look like? What would the essential things that we want them to know and be able to do in that first semester so that we can then um, prepare some different things? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that um, our when we created our distance learning docs that went out to our staff, that's what I did. I for high school, I really looked at um, taking. I took all the beginning level high school courses and I kind of lumped them together, um, and then I took all the advanced and I lumped them together. And then I met individually with all my photo teachers, and I met with all my ceramics and sculpture teachers, and we talked about okay, how can we continue photography within this? And I let them kind of work together. And so I just created, honestly, I feel like this has brought my staff closer. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're meeting more often. I think that's uh, one of the slides here is like, what will we continue moving, moving forward? Like I, I will continue to meet this way because I get to see them more often. I get to talk to them more often. I get to know exactly what's happening. We all get to problem solve and troubleshoot together. And so I feel like we're much closer as a staff than we were before. I agree. And it's been really wonderful for them to um, collaborate and um, figure out some different solutions and share strategies. Um, I think that that has really helped um, build their confidence also. Yeah. I think we can go to the next slide. So what are the changes that you're going to do in professional learning for this coming year, Lisa? Do you have any? Um, well, I mean, it all kinds of depends on what happens, of course, but I think that regardless, I'm going to keep my weekly office hours. Um, I'll, I'll come up with a day and a time that will just be, I'll just be sitting on a Google Hangout and they can drop in and ask questions or work together um, as a team. My teach, my middle school group decided that they all wanted uh, lesson ideas. And so three people volunteered to share their screen and present some of their remote learning lessons um, during our call tomorrow. So, um, you know, it's, it's exciting because I think I let them kind of drive the, the, the call and what they want and what they want to plan for next week on that call. Um, so I definitely will continue those, those virtual office hours. Yeah, those um, virtual office hours have been a blessing because um, you definitely feel more connected. And um, I think that having teachers share those strengths and the positives that are going on, plus just walking through those um, struggles that they're dealing with. We're really hoping for an opportunity to um, be together for professional learning, but um, knowing that that may not happen, we are putting into place um, some plans for online remote learning for our educators here in the state of Nebraska. And that's um, anything from how are we um, creating our units so that they're ready for the fall and um, then beefing up people's capabilities in technology. So our online learning, um, our school district gets done May 21st. And so we'll start those starting June 1st and we'll have sessions that are about an hour and a half long and teachers can join those. Um, we will also record them so that they could um, watch them at another time. And hopefully that will help them get to um, what they need. We've also been sharing our lessons. Um, we have everyone is putting everything into our Google Classroom so that we can see um, what people are doing and how they're doing it, how it can be individualized. Um, if a theme is the idea of hope, each teacher is creating their own connection with their school culture and finding different things about that culture that makes it unique to them, but it's under the same theme. And we are now also sharing examples, student examples as they um, 
turn them in, those go into a folder so that we can start to have a collection of different solutions to use and share with other schools. So those are some of the things that we're looking at for professional learning, how to get to those, how to find them, and what we can do with those next year. Yeah, so this last bullet here was something that was mentioned. Um, we meet with uh, fine arts supervisors every Friday throughout the state of Maryland that our Department of Education has put together. And so one of the things that we mentioned at our last meeting was now is the time to utilize the arts to support social and emotional needs of our students. Because what they believe was that um, all these different companies are going to come forth and say, oh, you know, we've created this program for your students and, and buy this program and buy that program to help support social and emotional needs. And the fine arts office is saying, no, this is what the arts do. And this is where the arts now need to step up and say, we support social and emotional needs. So don't filter money into programs that do that. Filter money into the arts because that's what we automatically do. And so how can we kind of step up in this realm as, and be leaders of this um, time to support our students? Yeah, so I'm excited to see, we we're starting a task force uh, through the state of Maryland. And, and so we're, we're really wanting to kind of be at the forefront of uh, creating this for our superintendents. Yeah, NAEA also has a lot of information that Mario, um, the current director is putting together and that will be online soon so that we can um, use that as a resource also um, to find ways to say, um, now more than ever in this um, very unusual time, the arts are a place for us to go and find that emotional support and the connectedness that we all are um, seeking. So we hope to share out those out in the coming weeks. So look for that on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram um, as we move through this time. And um, there's some position statements um, around this so that we'll be using those also. All right, what's on the next slide? Or there is a couple Q and A's. Christy, do we need anything right there before? We just have, I think you've hit on a lot of them. Um, people are loving the successful advocacy of like the importance of the arts in the context of COVID-19 and why it's important. So um, sharing stories I think is really important. And if, if there are any others that people would like to share, um, we'll have time to do that in a minute. Um, it also, I know here in Massachusetts, um, science, history, um, math, and English are quote unquote required for remote learning right now. And we're struggling, um, the arts are struggling a little bit as they're, as we switch to remote learning, they're providing resources, but it's not being emphasized in the same way as other subjects. And so there's some curiosity around how other states are managing that or if they're dealing with similar situations. I'll, I'll speak to that for just a minute, Christy. Here um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, we kind of had some administrators um, going through those modes of um, we're only going to focus on the four core areas and um, we're going to let the rest of it go. And if you had students in there, um, it does, it just doesn't matter. And so what we ended up doing was um, showcasing the themes that we were um, going to do for hope, um, connections, um, care, and um, we use those as a platform to then advertise through what our students were creating. And we put that into social media and into the newspapers. And it really helped bring our community together and gave us an opportunity to say, um, here's what we can do. We're not, we're not teaching skills and techniques. There's bigger things to go through in, in the arts. And this is what we can um, help our students understand this time and seek those pieces of just um, connection and understanding of what is going on around them. And that really flipped the switch for many of our administrators who said, oh, here's one way that we can engage our students even through this remote time to be a part of learning and do it through the arts. So we saw a huge um, 360 um, and people are now engaging in our courses. Great. That's great. And yeah. I think we, to, oh, go ahead, do you want to? 
I was going to say we're, we're our uh, school system isn't done um, until June sixteenth, and so we have quite a bit of time left. And so uh, we missed all of our exhibits, um, our countywide exhibits. We do big kind of countywide exhibits. I did get a senior exhibit though done. That was we did that in um, winter time, but um, but we missed our countywide exhibits. So we're we're I met today with our office of communications, and we're moving the entire thing online. And so we're trying to figure out how to make that happen so that students can still share the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, and so I'm hoping to get some really um, great um, outcome of that and, and still letting our community know that we're here and the arts are important and this is what we're able to do. Um, so uh, hopefully that, I mean, we're talking about thousands of works online for, for that exhibit. So um, fingers crossed, hopefully I can pull it off. <laughs> Did, did your teachers take photographs of that work prior to sending it or yeah that's some nice. yeah so um, I haven't asked for them to send the work yet um, but I'm going to allow them to use work uh, that they previously had or any new work that students have created that's so I'll, I'll give that choice to them yeah we've missed those too and I was trying to come up with some different ways to create an opportunity of a virtual exhibit. Um, so I'm hoping that teachers have um, photographs of that work. So um, let's move on and talk about what are your future needs. We'd really like to know how we can support you and what we um, can bring to you. Are you up for more webinars? Would you like a Google Hangout or Meetup to talk about different issues and what would those issues be? Um, what are the resources and um, information overloads that you're trying to deal with? Or is there um, a place where we might want to come back and talk about identifying universal essential outcomes and what those might be for remote learning and just share ideas with those? So we would really love to have your feedback um, and your ideas regarding these four topics or others that you might have. And we'd love to meet with you again and see what we can do. Yeah, so do we wanna um, let anybody kind of raise their hand? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, we can, um, we can even try that. I will say this is the first time I've used the raise your hand function, so we can definitely try it. So if anyone would like to um, add anything verbally, you can, there should be a raise your hand button and we will, we will try to get to you on that. While we're waiting for some questions to um, come in, we also had a question early on about um, in your, I know that licensure requirements vary by state. So teacher preparation mm -hmm. in every state looks very different, but um, here in Massachusetts, we don't have specific requirements as to a course that would teach technology or remote learning, although sometimes, depending on the university and the professor, it's embedded in there. So the question is, um, in your states or in other states, are there requirements for pre-service teachers to learn how to use remote learning? No. No. <laughs> but there should be, moving <laughs> forward. You know, we are <laughs> with new teachers that are digital natives, right? But using the tools that you need, um, in a classroom effectively versus just being someone who can post to Instagram or Twitter are two different things. And those are yeah. some of the questions and, and things that we're working through is how do you put an agenda up and talk through those different things? How do you have kids raise their hand to comment? How do you put them into Zoom chat rooms and then go around to listen to those and then bring them back together? All of those are conversations that we're having um, in our district. And we would really love to have teachers um, utilize those skills and learn those skills as good um, teaching strategies um, prior to coming into the district. Yeah, I was talking to um, a, a college um, student who was about to graduate and going through their student teaching. And, you know, I, we were having a, I was doing mock interviews with them and they were talking about how, how sad they were that they were missing their second 
uh, live, you know, um, student teaching experience. And I said, what if you looked at it as you actually got training that no other teacher prior to you has ever received in college? You know, like you, you got, you, you're lucky because you actually got the face to face uh, working directly with students and you got distance learning because most of them did at least one face-to-face mm-hmm. um, through elementary or something and then went into distance learning. So they got both and they were like, huh, I'd never thought of it that way. I was like, you just got complete training um, in how to do it both ways. And honestly, like maybe that's what really needs to happen in art education, you know, moving forward that they have the distance learning with one group and, um, you know, the live teaching with another group. I don't know. Something, though. We do have one um, question, and Susan, I'm going to allow you to talk, so go for it. You do have to unmute yourself. Okay, does that work? Yeah, hey, hi. Hi. Thank you. So I was wondering during this time period, are you encouraging teachers to find uh, video tutorials to show their students, A, to create video tutorials? And if you are, what if the teacher does not have a setup or even a place to do those demos? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good one. Do you want to take it, Lorinda, or I will? No. So in um, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, we're asking teachers to create short overview um, videos that will help walk a student through what the learning will, activity will be for the week. Um, we may have a few small um, videos, but uh, because of bandwidth with a lot of our students, um, videos and tutorial videos don't often come across very well. So we're trying to keep those down to um, five minutes or less. And um, then we are also doing some things on our local television and um, students can then um, find a local access channel and watch some of the different things that way. Um, But we're not really going into um, 30 or even um, 20 minute tutorials at this district. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't give our teachers um, a limit. Uh, most of their lessons are about 30 minutes long um, that they did a recording. We are also using our local TV station. And so uh, we pre-recorded uh, just for elementary um, lessons that they can watch. Um, we taught all of our teachers how to use Screencastify. Mm -hmm. And it's a Google Chrome extension. And so therefore they take their uh, PowerPoint or Google slides and they um, can use that to record themselves. They kind of show up in a little box in the corner. And so they're giving the presentation as if they were in the classroom. Um, I did tell them that they could use YouTube to find videos. However, I said, you must watch every single second of that YouTube video Um, You can't just assume that it's good after watching the first few minutes. You have to have watched the entire thing because you just never know what's in there. Our students on our Chromebooks cannot access YouTube videos. So we um, use a program called MyVRSpot and um, a YouTube video can be uploaded to MyVRSpot. That way it takes out any of the um, advertisements or connections to any other pieces. Um, And so some teachers are using short clips from YouTube also. Another thing that we have in our district is that's when we had those three days that teachers came back. We asked them to grab the um, equipment that they had in their classroom. So for my teachers, it was an iPad, a just stand, their um, MacBooks and any other um, microphones or um, different things that they would use in their classroom to create those videos and we asked them to take those home with them. And so they have those tools and then any textbooks or anything that we had so that they had those available to them when they got to their spaces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, we are just about at four o'clock. So I just want to um, say a quick word about the survey. So in order for us to continue our conversation today and to best support you, we'd be grateful if you could take a few minutes to complete it's a very short survey based on the topics we covered in today's session. Please head over to tinyurl.com slash artsupers2020. If you complete the survey by Friday, May 1st, we'll automatically enter you in a drawing to win a print copy of art our Art Education and Practice Series book, Differentiated Instruction in Art by Heather Fountain. Um, I think you'll find the book loaded with practical information on how to help your teachers dif differentiate instruction, curriculum, and assessment, and much of the strategies are, ap are applicable for face-to-face -face and remote learning. It's, it's really a fantastic book. If you don't have it, I highly recommend it. Um, I also want to remind you that davisart.com slash free resources have, has lots of great things, including some on-demand video lessons that you might found helpful um, with the tutorials that you were just mentioning. Um, there you'll see more weekly webinars, um, access to the Davis Digital Platform, free professional development sessions, access to School Arts Magazine online, and like I mentioned, some of the on-demand videos. Our weekly webinars are every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Next week, we have Michael Townsend and Leah Smith who have over 25 years of experience working in tape art. The focus of their talk will be on how they've used art for healing and how you can use tape art as a way to help your students heal from this traumatic time. They'll answer questions you have about working with the medium, tape as a medium to make art, as well as what it's like to make a living creating community-based public art um, later in the series, we'll hear from experts on adaptive art, photography, mindfulness, making murals, fashion, engaging with contemporary art at the elementary level, and lots of great things. Um, so head over to davisart.com slash free resources to sign up, with, sign up for those. And I would really like to thank all of our, our presenters today. Lorinda and Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your willingness to help supervisors across the country, especially during this time. And thank you for, to everyone for joining us today. We hope that you stay safe and healthy and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.